um, so that the whole tech and digital ecosystem and industry can level up as a whole and we can all be better as a result. Um, so that's kind of the angle that I'm, I'm coming at it. Um, so first of all, I wanted to just give a little bit of a kind of backdrop around the tech sector and where we sort of are from a UK perspective. Um, so actually we're number one um, in terms of the whole of, or should I say now, the rest of Europe. Um, and actually number three in the world. Um, and that's just behind um, the US and China. So we're sort of the main challenges to, to, to those two big areas. Um, and actually we've got a really great leverage as um, a country with a deep science and technology base. Um, but the reason we're leading the way um, is actually in terms of being responsible and having real sort of values led innovation. That's kind of our USP as the tech sector as a whole. In terms of the people, we've got about three million people um, working in the, the tech industry as a whole, and you've got real world-class companies bringing in a new generation of talent as well, so that's kind of ever-growing. But again, sort of talking from a regional perspective, it's because of the elevation of regional areas that really sort of builds up the UK tech sector. We don't necessarily sort of think as a whole um, that those sort of silos and those pockets of innovation are actually make what makes us really strong. So um, actually there are eight cities in the UK that are now um, home to two unicorn companies um, or more. And that's Bristol, uh, Cambridge, Edinburgh, Leeds, London, Manchester, Nottingham and Oxford as well. Um, so you can kind of see there where it spreads out, but there's also a lot of the UK to cover. Um, and sort of Brighton and Sussex isn't mentioned on that yet. So there's a bit of a gap, but also a bit of an opportunity that kind of comes with it. And the next thing I wanted to talk about is maybe why there are some barriers around that, sort of around the power of scaling up um, and around um, essentially the tech sector growing to be sort of bigger than it is at the moment. Um, I'm a fan of alliteration because I used to work in marketing and also the power of three. So I've gone for three things, all starting with P. So it's easy to remember, and it's people, places, and pounds. Um, so I'm going to start with the pounds first. Uh, and it's all around sort of investment. So um, again, just to kind of give a bit of a sort of shape of the landscape, really. Um, in 2022, actually, investment sort of overall has dropped by 32%. Um, it dropped less than that in the UK. So we're doing better in terms of the number of people investing. The, I guess the confidence levels in other regions, but it does still mean that we've got a 28% drop since the pandemic. Investors generally, when we are either in an economic downturn or when there are periods of uncertainty, so thinking about, I'm not going to swear, but the absolute show that is <laughs> the last few years um, from, from COVID to Brexit to everything else that's kind of happening on a real sort of like macro global scale, it basically just makes people nervous. Um, and when people are nervous, they don't want to make decisions. And the point at which you're passing money and exchanging hands, that's kind of make, making a decision and committing to it. So it's not necessarily that there's less money around, it's just that people feel a little bit nervous about sort of where to put that money um, and committing to investing and funding startups. Um, and that's sort of where we're at at the moment. And then sort of from a geographical perspective, again, um, London uh, is way ahead. Um, it absolutely sort of dwarfs the number um, of investors and the total amount of investment um, than anywhere else in the UK. Uh, actually, Greater London uh, is 10 times greater um, in terms of the investment to the next region, which does happen to be the southeast, um, but there is a huge gap there. Um, that is quite typical in terms of capital cities. Um, generally, you'll find that financial services firms are all sort of based in the capital city. Um, you've also got um, the, the government as well, um, and then sort of other clusters of, of regulators as well. So that's sort of quite typical, but it's that kind of gap between London and the rest of the UK that, that maybe there's a bit of a threat slash an opportunity there. Um, and then if you actually think about sort of the number of, um, again, sort of unicorn businesses that are across the UK, there's not 10 times the amount of unicorn businesses in London than there are in other cities. 
So you've got 10 times the amount of investment, but in terms of then how London is performing in terms of unicorn businesses, so that's, sorry, businesses that um, have been valued at one billion or more, um, actually given the amount that they're being given, they're not performing as well as they should, given the money that's been handed over. So I don't know why it's crap. Sorry? I don't know why it's low in London, basically. Essentially, in terms of how much money is going into specific businesses, okay. they're not um, performing at the level that potentially, at the level that they could in comparison to other businesses that have been given less but are now valued at more. Mm -hmm. um, it's yes, it is related to ROI for, from a VC perspective. Um, and then it's also, I guess it's a bit more of a matter of growth as well. Yeah. So another city could have been given a tenth of that, but grown sort of like way higher, essentially. Could it be also related to cost of the cities? You know, we know salaries in London are significantly higher than here. Potentially, but if you're looking at sort of how much invest, well, how much return on investment is coming from an, um, from the amount that a VC is giving you, you would sort of look at profit as well as the kind of overall valuation. So the, the, the two, again, yes, but it, the two are kind of comparative, then mm -hmm. it's not comparative. Um, mm -hmm. So they're getting more, there's more investment in London, but beyond what the London weighting is, as an example, as a very high level analogy. Thank you. But thank you for the question, and feel free to drop in questions at any time. It's not like a place of waiting to be able to have a happy to have, have a discussion. Um, so that's kind of the pounds bit around investment and funding and VCs, activity, nerves around the economy. Um, the next bit is places. So we've definitely seen since post-pandemic um, that uh, a lot more businesses are working remotely. Um, there's real globalisation um, as well, so you've got lots of people working in lots of different countries in the same team. Um, and then as a result, there's an influx of, kind of co-working spaces that are opening, um, but also kind of people working from home. Um, which on one hand can be a positive in terms of working with global teams and diversity, um, but actually sort of what you're also looking at is people kind of losing that connection, um, that kind of like over the kind of coffee counter, chats to people, um, just collaborating, this, you know, everyone sort of talks around the, the efficiency of getting work done at home, but is it all about like getting your to-do list done, or is it also about kind of the, the stuff that kind of sparks off the back of having a conversation with someone, or just feeling inspired by the energy in the room, um, and just a little bit motivated by kind of going through the same stuff as other people and, and talking that through. Um, so again, we've kind of got a bit of a, a positive and a negative there. I think more and more people are looking for sort of what we're calling the third space that isn't home, but it's also not the office. Um, and then going back to that co-working piece, so actually London is known as the best city in the world for co-working. So from a UK perspective, we, we, we're sort of on the map, so to speak, um, and actually we have a thousand more co-working spaces in London than we do in Paris, which is the second down. It's just over 1,300 altogether. Um, and there's loads of co-working spaces in uh, Birmingham, Manchester, um, as well as London. So they're sort of top bigger cities in, in the UK. But again, what about the rest of the UK? Um, thinking about those clusters, kind of picking up um, to, to really put sort of all of us on, on the map. And then back to that, that people start. So, Three million um, working together in the UK tax sector. Um, actually, sort of over the last couple of years, technology has really been an enabler for individuals, um, maybe who haven't worked in the tech industry, but in terms of sort of how we're we're, we're working, um, as well as kind of companies and communities as well, um, and it's facilitated new ways of working and probably got us through what could have been a much trickier. Um, pandemic from a business perspective, um, but it also has been a source of job creation um, as well as people have pivoted their businesses um, and, and also people sort of reskilling and upskilling as well um, to create sort of new jobs that maybe sort of weren't necessarily um, sort of technical before. Um, and there's also more people working in the tech industry 
not in technical roles as well. So the landscape is changing um, and, and that kind of gives a little bit of context around that, that number of people. Um, but also we're not in the same labour market as we were pre-pandemic. Um, and actually, you know, you've, you, you've sort of still got um, a lot of people who are either out of work um, in technical roles are looking, but then you've also got companies that are looking to fill technical roles, but perhaps sort of in different positions. And um, there's a bit of a mismatch at the moment in terms of sort of the unemployment within the, the this sort of area, um, and and the, the the gaps to fill. So there's sort of a skill shortage, but also a lot of people on the market as well. Um, and actually, what can sometimes happen with startups is they've got a bit of a kind of hire quickly, fire quickly mentality, um, which is as a result of that sort of high growth, um, yeah, high growth, slightly short-sighted sort of thinking, which can sometimes come off the back of kind of VCs. But we know that actually people are the lifeblood of what we do, um, and sometimes it's less about kind of the the, um, the skill set initially. And really about sort of bringing the right people in um, and sort of start with people first, kind of rather than strategies first. We're also going to talk a little bit about underrepresentation in tech. Um, so, first of all, um, there's a real sort of importance to think around diversity, equity, and inclusion um, when sort of hiring. Um, that's both within the businesses, but then also um, a lot of VCs and then alternative funding businesses sort of really need to think about their own biases um, when investing as well and sort of slanting towards sort of male founded um, businesses. Um, there's a sort of trend uh, that's been kind of referred to as like tech inclusivity um, and people needing to think a little bit more creatively um, when sort of bringing in and hiring their leadership team. And then actually if we sort of go on to um, representation of women in tech, so no European country, and I'm talking about Europe and the UK, um, actually reaches 30% when it comes to um, sort of women um, represented, being represented um, in the tech industry. So a couple of kind of points around, um, sort of around the whole people um, piece. First of all, thinking around diversity and inclusion not necessarily about just hiring from underrepresented groups but also thinking about the number of people on the market and then the gaps um, within sort of existing jobs um, and how to be a little bit more sort of creative um, rather than looking for you know what might be sort of a hundred percent match again sort of going back to the people piece um, which leads on to the next point you know upskilling and reskilling is much cheaper um, is much, yeah, it's much cheaper um, than, than the cost of recruiting someone new, um, and those people already exist and already out there. Um, building a strong leadership team, so um, actually sort of thinking about what you're strong in, and then rather than hiring perhaps like a number of mini me's and people that are similar to you, it's kind of who needs to who needs to fill the gaps and do the jobs that perhaps aren't your strengths, and then being really considered and intentional about the size of the team as well. Um, going back to that kind of hire quickly, fire quickly, and start thinking beyond the sort of one year piece or even the immediate need, more around the sort of three year, five year strategy. Is this person going to be right for the next 12 months? But actually, how's that role going to evolve in the next three to five years? If we can even sort of start imagining that um, and then sort of hire for that um, and keep, keep retention essentially. So we've talked a bit about the kind of USPs of Brighton and of Sussex um, and a little bit around um, a sort of snapshot of the technology landscape, some of the threats, some of the opportunities, some of the good stuff that we do really well already, um, perhaps like where some of the barriers are. Um, so how does that kind of all fit together in terms of Silicon Brighton and what we do? I'm going to go back to community. Um, so this is the dictionary definition of community. Um, so it's a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. I'm going to go to my favourite definition of community, um, or the one that kind of resonates most with me, 
and that's actually Aristotle. Um, the sum is greater than its parts. Um, so what I guess I kind of mean by that, or how I interpret it, is that together we're greater, we're bigger, we're stronger, we're more connected, and actually if we kind of add up everything that we do within our individual efforts, if you add that all together and work as one cohesive team, you can achieve more um, than what we would if we were sort of all working on our own, especially around something that perhaps we're all trying to do something about or something that we're all trying to change. Um, and that's very much what we want to do at Silicon Brighton. It's, it's, it's our purpose, it's kind of why we exist. It's all about um, helping the local technology and digital ecosystem um, within the southeast. So going back to the people, we start with the individuals. We want to give everyone kind of opportunities to come together, um, to network, but also to make friends. Don't really like the word networking. It's sort of about making contacts or referrals or introductions, but also friendships. Um, and supporting people, mentoring, um, you know, helping solve problems, um, so that actually that kind of develops business growth as well, um, because people, you know, stay in those careers and feel supported in them, and actually kind of thrive in them as well. Um, and if you help those individuals, that helps business growth. Um, you know, new businesses pop up, um, and also you know, businesses sort of stay strong and get bigger and better because of staff retention. And then if you can help with business growth, then that really sort of puts that area on the map as being a technology hub, a technology ecosystem. Um, and I'm going to go back to that bit, not instead of another city, but as well as another city, as well as every city, um, so that we can create all these tech clusters and that the industry gets bigger and better kind of as a whole. And how we do that personally is through lots and lots and lots of different events, um, basically. Um, there are nearly 30 actually, I feel like every time um, I talk about Silicon Brighton the number goes up, um, again I guess a, um, a bit of a testament to kind of post lockdown appetite for just coming together and being in a room which I think the crowds at Digifest can also kind of account for as well. Um, and we've actually got one of our meetup organisers in the room today, um, Ben, who runs Lean Agile Brighton with other people. Um, a, a really quite a good strong team of other people as well um, and they've got a conference coming up uh, actually next month um, yeah the Lean Agile Brighton conference so um, these are all the meetups that are happening kind of in and around Brighton um, there are others again Brighton is just a hub um, and we just sort of see ourselves as the hub we sort of started there um, and all these meetups are run by volunteers and they're free to join and we simply support them our role is just to sort of partner really um, we help with the event logistics, um, we'll help sort out the AV, um, we put on the beer and pizza um, as and when the, the, company, the meetup is looking for sponsors um, and generally sort of help with branding, awareness um, and promotion. Um, we want them to be as accessible and as inclusive as possible as well, um, so they are all free to attend. Um, and we're always looking for a really sort of wide range of um, speakers and of organisers as well. So I think when you've kind of got role models at the heart of it, running it, working in it, speaking at it, um, then that tends to attract more people. Um, and then when different people come in the room and they feel really welcome, then that kind of continues a virtuous circle. talks about the people bit and kind of how we try and nurture them. I'm going to address the diversity bit and how we're trying to do something about that. Um, so we run an initiative called Diverse Sussex. Um, we basically at events try and kind of capture what's on people's minds, what people are worrying about, talking about, trying to solve. Um, and it kept kind of coming back to this, to this diversity piece, how do we get different people working for us. Um, we don't know the answers, but we know that between everyone who is part of our um, kind of ecosystem, they all together each be doing something that is a little piece of the puzzle. And if we can kind of share all of that collectively between all the different um, companies, businesses, people, um, then if we add all of that up, there probably is a solution. Not tomorrow, it's not just about the quick wins, but I think if you do sort of make those quick wins and incremental changes, then that over time kind of celebrates and embraces real change. Um, we also noticed that a lot of the data, um, if you look at um, sort of diversity and the demographic of people and businesses, 
it's very um, London-centric when people talk about the South East. So we wanted to create something that was really um, bespoke and targeted um, towards the rest of the South East, essentially. So it's Sussex-based businesses, either um, technology businesses uh, or um, businesses with big tech teams, essentially. So we have a number of signatories that have signed up, and then we've gone out and captured data from all of those, um, both quantitative but also then qualitative, um, asking people what they're doing that works really well, um, how are they trying to sort of solve specific challenges in their business, um, so that when we produce the report, which is going to be later on this year, um, it's not just about saying, oh dear, it's the problem, yeah, isn't it dire? Um, actually, here's where we're at at the moment, it's fine, let's not all punish ourselves, let's just sort of see what the accurate state of play is and not compare ourselves or try and benchmark ourselves against London. Um, but look, sort of very much kind of within our own area um, and try and gain sort of real insights from different businesses on what's working so we can kind of share that as a collective. And then if I look at the, um, I guess the sort of places and the pounds bit, so the, the space, office space, co-working space, whatever it is, um, and then also so funding. We don't so solve those problems um, and we don't try to. Um, we are, I guess, very confident about what we do do well, but we're also really confident and honest about what we don't do at all. Um, but what we do have is really great partnerships um, and mem members, um, as Donna said, and, and um, Donna's company, Switch Play, is one of those. Um, yeah, what we do is kind of, I guess, stay in our own lane, um, but understand and make really good relationships with the people that are doing the stuff that we don't do. So thinking about the universities, from a pipeline of talent perspective, thinking about the co-working spaces from a places perspective, um, and then there's a um, community of uh, angel investors very much focused around the southeast as well. So if we can't do something, we're really honest about it, but we've usually got an answer or a connection um, of someone who kind of can help towards solving that problem. Um, so this is just a kind of couple of calls to actions. Um, how can you kind of contribute to the programme and the community work that we're doing? Um, so you can be a supporter. Um, it's essentially sort of a nominal monthly fee every month that companies pay um, that funds the work that we're doing so it continues to keep the events free for people that want to attend. Um, we're about to go out with a big sort of sponsorship programme, so looking for high-level businesses um, to support the whole programme and contribute to it. Um, and then you can also be a partner. Um, so this is for people that um, don't necessarily want to or can't contribute financially, um, but may have time, resources or skills um, that they do want to contribute. Um, so our meetup organisers are all our partners, um, the venues are all our partners, um, the universities, um, everyone that does a talk, um, and they are all as important, if not more, um, than the people that are that are contributing financially. Um, and that's us, that's how you can join our community. It's a bit of an overwhelming slide, but, um, <laughs> but I guess the, the, uh, the intention more was just to show you kind of how many different ways you can engage with us. Um, so we've got our events calendar, um, that's a QR code to have a look at that. Um, we're all over social, TikTok, Instagram, uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, I'm struggling with those icons there, I'm not massively on social. Um, and then we've got a Slack workspace as well. Um, so in between coming to the events, we've got a really engaged community, probably about sort of 3,000 or so people on there. You can either sort of lurk in the background and just sort of see what's happening. You can use it as a bit of self-promotion um, or an ask for help. Um, or you can sort of post other events or initiatives or, or anything like that, that that you're working on as well. Uh, and that's me and how you can connect with me on LinkedIn or feel free to kind of come and talk to me afterwards. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sort of all ears in terms of saying hi or answering any questions um, or working with you to um, start your own meetup or event or anything you'd like to do. And that is everything from me.